Hello, I'm Pastor Robinson. Welcome to the Breath of Life Crusade series from Phoenix, Arizona. Through these videotapes, you will experience the entire evangelistic crusade featuring the preaching of Dr. Charles D. Brooks. As you follow along, may I encourage you to have your Bible, pen, and paper ready to jot down the text which might be helpful to you. May God bless you now as we study together. rather be here than in any other place in Phoenix this morning. I thank God for the privilege that we have and I thank God for you. I thank God for the inspiring music we've heard this morning. Bless his holy name. You know, I don't know if God experiences frustration or not. But if he did, I could understand it. He has done so much to try to save us. And we resist so vehemently. Why is it so hard? to save lost men who are bound for doom and damnation. Why is it so difficult? This morning I would like to appeal to you not to make excuses for disobeying God. In the book of Luke, chapter 14, and beginning with verse 16, Jesus tells a story 
A certain man made a great supper and bad many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bitten, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room and the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, Jesus didn't tell this just to entertain the crowd. There are serious implications here. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ said a man bad many. They were invited. They had the special privilege of being invited to the richest house in the area. The hospitality of this man knew no bounds. Great preparations had been made. But the first man to whom he sent his servant said, I have bought some land. I've got to go see it. Now in that part of the world, breakfast was eaten in the morning. Dinner was eaten sometimes early afternoon. And supper was eaten when the field work was done and the sun had set. Darkness had gathered. How flimsy an excuse. I bought land. I want to go see it. The truth is he could hardly see his land for the gathering shadows. A made up excuse to resist the kindness of the Lord. The second man said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I've got to go prove them. Now, you don't do that at night. Five yoke of oxen, I want to try them out. See if I've gotten a good deal. See if they know how to pull the plow. So inasmuch as I am involved in my work, I pray thee have me excused. After all, i got to eat. Got to make a living, have me excused. The third man said, I've married a wife. Now I suppose if there's any one of them that had a reasonable excuse, he did. But you notice how he put it. He didn't say, I don't want to come or I shouldn't come. He said, I cannot come. Apparently that wife had already established herself as the ruler of that household. And the master of the house got angry. And he said, forget them who have had such privilege, who have heard the word of the Lord. Go out into the streets and the lanes and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. They went and did that and he came back and said, they are here but there's still room. He said, then go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, 
we have a way of putting a premium on status and on finance. Some of those with the most education have the least concern about their own souls and the invitation of the Lord. Therefore, God says, in my sight, all men are equal. Go out and get the poor, the halt, the mean, the blind. And after you get through with them, go out into the highways. Look in the gutters where sinners have fallen. Compel them to come. They will take the place of the high and the mighty. They will take the places of those who are too busy to hear the word of the Lord. They will take the places of those who have to make a living and know that they are dying. Ladies and gentlemen, your scripture this morning asked perhaps the most pertinent question you could consider today. What profiteth it a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? I don't think people understand. Therefore, they put friends ahead of God, pleasure ahead of God. Men and women have been coming and listening to the word of the Lord. That's the invitation. But when it comes to doing what God says, they easily make excuses. Well, you know, I've got an appointment. And an appointment with a man is more important than an appointment with God. It is not Brooks who gives the invitation. It is the Holy Spirit trying to win souls to Christ. He wants you to come home to the banquet. But we make excuses. Money and cars and habits and all kinds of things stand in the way. One writer said, whatever receives your first affection and attention is your God. Did you hear what I said? Some think in order to worship idols, you've got to go out in the jungles and you've got to cut down a tree or worship a river or a lion or something made of gold or silver. No, whatever receives your highest affection and attention is your God. A friend then can be an idol. A job can be an idol. A wife or a husband can be an idol. Whatever comes between you and obeying the Lord and receiving and accepting His invitation is more important than God. Therefore, that thing is your God. I want to assure you, beloved, if you don't intend to go to heaven, you ought to consider the only other option. And Satan actually convinces some people that going to hell won't be so bad after all. There will be no rejoicing in hell. There will be no high fives in hell. There will be no triumph in hell. The alternative to heaven ought to be considered so that we put a proper premium on eternal life. There is nothing going on in Phoenix that is more important now than getting ready for the coming of our Lord. Amen. Nothing, I say. Amen. Let me read to you some of the strangest words that Jesus ever uttered. I'm going to the book of St. Mark. Chapter 9, and I'm going to begin with verse 43. And if you have the red letter edition, this is written in red, the words of Jesus. And he says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands go to hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. 
And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. I read that so that my strange title would have credibility. My title today is Knock Out Your Eye, Cut Off Your Head. This strange counsel came from Jesus. But I can assure you, Christ was not advocating self-mutilation. Last night we talked about those ceremonial things that were nailed to the cross. And amongst them was circumcision as a spiritual duty. It simply pointed forward to Jesus' ministry and the ministry of the Holy Ghost, which would enable us to cut off the things of the flesh. To cut loose from the things that are as precious to us as our right eye or our right hand or our right foot. Nothing should be more precious than the invitation from Jesus to come for all things are now ready. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to literally cut off your hand. You don't have to literally pluck out your eye. You don't have to literally cut off your right foot. But what Christ is saying, if there is something that is so precious to you that you find it standing in the way of your obeying me, then cut it off. Get rid of it. Better to go to heaven, halt or blind or maimed, than having everything you want to go to hell. Now there are all kinds of things that stand in the way of people obeying God. I've already referred to jobs. There are those who obey the boss, but will not obey the Lord. On the Sabbath day he said, In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It is not the decision of this church. It is not the mandate of a committee. It is the command of the living God. That we do not work on the Sabbath, but rather take time for spiritual worship and meditation. Gather with Him and be blessed by His presence. And no boss on earth Amen. should come ahead of Jesus. Amen. Oh, but you say, Pastor, I'll lose my job. You think I didn't face that? You think there are not other people in this room right now? Who went through that? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it is better to obey God than to keep a job. Amen. Soup and crackers beat hell. Would you say amen out there? Amen. But here is the thing that I don't understand. God has to keep you while you're disobeying him. If God ever turned his head, in an instant you would be annihilated. We are kept the just and the unjust. By the power and the goodness and the graciousness of God. While you are disobeying Him, He keeps your heart pumping. He keeps your mind working. He keeps you breathing the breath of life. If God takes care of you when you don't know what to do, what makes you think He'll let you starve to death if you make up your mind to obey Him? Where is your faith? What are we thinking about? What kind of God do you think we serve? The Bible says in Matthew 6, Take no thought for tomorrow. What you're going to eat on. What you're going to put on. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
And the Bible concludes by saying, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In Psalm 37 and verse 25, the man said, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. If there's anybody out there with a testimony like that, let me hear you say amen now. God takes care of you. God will help you. God will supply even if you lose your job. God will supply. Young man came to me and told me he lost his job because he wanted to obey the Sabbath. And he said, Pastor, I felt good giving up that job. After all, he felt a little bit like a hero. And he was rejoicing at first. But after two weeks, and he couldn't find a job, and his money began to run out, and the closet was getting empty, and the icebox needed refurbishing, he began to wonder, where is God? Why doesn't he do something after all I've done for him? Well, let me tell you, God will test your faith. He'll see if you're for real or not. And so nothing happened. And he began to suffer. They are now eating beans and rice with nothing else. And finally he went out. And by the grace of God, he found another job. Making more money. And doing well. He decided, I'll explain this thing before I go to work. So he told the foreman, you might as well understand now that at sunset on Friday, I cannot be here. Now I will do it any other time except on the Sabbath. The boss said, that's all right, go to work. But after about a week, he was called in to see the CEO. Now these are true stories. This young man came to my office and told me this. Now ordinary workers didn't go to see the CEO. He said when he walked in, the man was reading some papers, didn't even look up. Yes, what do you want? He gave his name. Oh, he said, you're that fellow that won't work Friday night. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody works here. Even I work here Friday night. Now, you either do what everyone else does. You are not special. And if you can't do it, you lose your job. He said, Pastor, my heart sank in me. I had already explained it. I'd gone through it once before. And I wondered, Lord, what are you doing? Am I going to lose this job? And for a moment he wavered. But then the Holy, Holy Ghost stiffened his spinal cord. You know that's what we need? We need some backbone. Would you say amen? And when the Holy Ghost came, he stood there risking everything. He said, sir, I explained this the day I came to work. It is not a matter of choice. I'm conscientious about this. I have no choice. But to put God first, and if this job cannot be held by an obedient Christian, if I have to break God's commandments in order to keep this job, then you can have your job. Amen. The CEO looked up and smiled for the first time. He said, oh, go on to work. We've already decided to keep you. I was just testing you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God will keep his word. And before I would break his law, knowingly and willingly, I'd eat peanut butter and jelly. And if that ran out, I'd stand on the street like I see all these people doing. And I would ask the Lord to let somebody buy my newspaper. I would shine shoes. I would do anything rather than disobey God. If you're not willing to obey God, you're not worth saving. Martin Luther King said, a man who doesn't have a cause for which he's willing to die is not fit to live. And my cause is not civil rights, though I believe in it. And I support it out of my pocket. And I led my churches to support it. And I participated in it. I'm not willing to die for that. I'm not willing to die for a lot of things. But I'll tell you right now, if it comes to choosing to obey God, it's better, the Bible says, to yield your life. For the Bible says, he that loseth his life shall find it. Better to have eternal life than to go to hell, calling ourselves living down here. Then there are some 
who put the family ahead of God have to get permission, even though they're full grown, have to get permission from somebody to obey God. Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you what Jesus says. Matthew 10 and verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before me, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. These are the words of Christ written in red. Some people think they got to have it smooth all the time. Well, who do you think you are that you got to have it smooth all the time? There's a song in the hymnal that says, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Who do you think you are? Everything's got to fall your way before you can do what God said. How are you going to stand up there in heaven next to Peter who was crucified upside down for the truth's sake? How will you stand up there in heaven with St. Paul whose head was chopped off by Herod for the truth's sake? How will you stand up there with Daniel who was thrown into a lion's den? Or the Hebrew boys who went into a fiery furnace. Or the 50 millions put to death by the church during the dark ages. How are you going to stand with him? And above all, how will you stand with Jesus? Laid down his life rather than take the easy road. The Bible says in verse 35 of Matthew 10. I am come, said Jesus, to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes. You know what a foe is? An enemy. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross, cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. These are not my words. They are the words of Jesus. And so if some relative or some close friend tells you not to obey God, cut him off. Better to go in heaven all by yourself than to go to hell in a crowd. Would you say amen out there? Then there are those who just want to please the crowd. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. I want you to follow this. There Jesus said, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter ye in at the straight gate. Straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many they be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it. May I remind you, the crowd has never been right. In Noah's day, the crowd drowned. And only a small group saved in the ark. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the crowd burned with fire and brimstone. And only four people got out and one looked back to the crowd and was lost forever, turned into a pillar of salt. The crowd has never been right. The Son of God himself preached for three and a half years. And when he finished his ministry, only 120, including the disciples, the crowd had turned him off. The crowd has never been right. Amen. Now Jesus said, if you're looking for a gate, enter ye in at the straight gate. I don't know if you notice those words, but straight is not spelled 
S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. Like a straight line. It is spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. And it doesn't mean a straight line. It means hard, difficult, austere, particular. Would you say amen? amen? Now what does gate mean? When Jacob was fleeing from his brother, he came to a wilderness, set a stone for a pillar, and laid down the rest. And as he did, God gave him a vision in the night of angels ascending and descending on what we call Jacob's lap. And God renewed his covenant with Jacob. And the next morning, Jacob decided to build an altar and dedicate that spot. He said, this shall be called Bethel. Now the word Beth is a prefix that means house of. In the Bible, you read of a lot of cities named Beth something. Bethany, the house of mercy. The house of hospitality. The house where one will find succor. That's where Mary and Martha lived. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there was Beth Bethesda. Beth Ezda, house of healing. There was Beth Sayada, house of fish. Beth means house of. This man Jacob decided to name this place Beth El. El is a contraction of Elohim, the name of God. So Beth El means house of God. And Jacob said, this is not only the house of God, it is the gate. It is what? It is the gate to heaven. So ladies and gentlemen, the house of God ought to be the gate to heaven. And Jesus said in the last days, as you look for a gate to heaven, don't enter the easy gate, the wide gate, where the crowd rushes in, doesn't have to give up anything. The liquor drinker can keep his body. The cigarette smoker can keep his cigarettes. The man who has habits can keep his habits. Even the adulterer can keep his woman if he gives a sufficient offering. Enter ye not in at the wide gate and the broad way that leads to destruction. But if you're looking for the gate to heaven, find a straight gate. Find a strict church. Find a church that stands for something. Find a church that has some standards. Find a church that doesn't compromise but says you've got to obey the commandments of God. Enter in at the straight gate that leads unto life. The crowd has never been right. And then there are habits. How many times have people said to me, well, pastor, you know I'd like to do it, but I got this habit, and I can't help myself. Well, I understand that. What I want you to understand further is, though, there's somebody who can help. There is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. And the song goes on to say, power, power, wonder working power. In the blood. Last weekend you heard one of my associates, Cliff Harris. And it's not a pretty story. And he doesn't tell it to entertain anybody. But he tells it to testify that even though he was hooked on drugs for 20 years, he disappointed his family, even his little children pleaded with him. He tells that story to let you know there is power. And when he made up his mind to accept that power, the stranglehold of the devil was broken. No excuse to hold on to heaven. I hear people say, well, you know, Pastor, I, uh, I drink and my, my daddy was a drunk, trying to blame his daddy. 
or maybe his granddaddy, and it's in my blood. Maybe it is, but there is power in his blood. Would you say amen? Somebody else says, Pastor, I've been smoking three packs a day for 30 years. And I just hate to give up this habit that helps me. It calms my nerves. It keeps me from gaining weight. And I just find it hard to give up this habit. I say give up. Listen, let me give you a profound and simple statement. You don't have to give up anything to serve God that will not destroy you eventually. Amen. Nothing worth having do you have to give up. I get sick and tired of these murmuring Christians who don't enjoy being Christians, but they're scared to leave. So they say, in the church, there's nothing to do. Now what they really mean is, I can't do what I really want to do. There's more to do in this church than you will ever get done. Amen. Hanging in my garage right now are twin Schwinn bicycles. Oh, that's something to do. I've got the exercise equipment that I need to get to. There's something to do. I got tennis racks. Don't know how to play, but nobody has more fun. Got a self set of golf clubs. I've only played about five games. But I enjoyed it as much as the pros. Don't tell me there's nothing to do. I have a whole collection of good music. I've got an expensive stereo. Don't tell me there's nothing to do. And there's no rock and roll in my collection either. And no blues. One day, one of my brothers, not this one, but another brother, who gave his life to smoking and, and to dissipating his health, he picked up one of my cameras. I had a night card. And everybody who knows cameras knows that's a pretty good camera. And he knows that I don't make much money. And he held my camera and he looked at me and he said, Chuck, how can you afford a camera like this on your side? I said, I use my liquor money. <laughs> and, I, and I buy film with my cigarette money. You burn up a suit of clothes. Twice a year, smoking cigarettes. And every one of them will take minutes off your life. So when somebody tells me about giving up, it sounds so ridiculous. I find myself saying, give up? What are you giving up? When you give up liquor, you're only giving up wasting your money like a fool. Walking and talking like a fool. Looking like a fool. Treating your family like a fool. What are you giving up? And if you give up cigarettes, all you're giving up is stained teeth and stained fingers and foul breath and emphysema and cancer of the lung. What are you giving up? You don't have to give up a thing to serve God except that which will hurt you and destroy your soul. Everything good you can keep. Everybody say amen to that. Let the devil get away with that lie too long. And then there are some who say, well, pastor, I've been here and I've heard it, but I can't leave my church. I am sentimentally attached. My church has gorgeous stained windows and my grandmother paid for the window. And over on this side, my aunt bought that window. I help pay for the organ. I can't leave. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. And I hope you never forget what I'm about to say. One day, Jesus went into his church. And he saw the money changers there. He saw the corruption and the disbelief and the traditionalism. And he saw all of this stuff that was taught instead of the truth. And Jesus nodded together a scourge. And he said, you get out of here. Ye shall not make my, make that a note, my, a possessive pronoun, my. Ye shall not make my father's house a den of thieves. That was Jesus' church, and he didn't like sin in his church. So he drove them out. Not only that, but one of his great, 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 great granddaddies built the church. His name was Solomon. You can read it in Matthew chapter 1. 
Uh, here was a church where the wallpaper was solid gold. Here was a church where the spires were coated with gold. Here was a church that had been refurbished by Herod it, with white marble shipped from Rome. Here was a church the most magnificent ever built in the history of the world. Jesus said, this is my church. This is where my parents come. But when he kept on teaching, and they kept on rejecting the truth, when he gave them hope of eternal life, and they turned their backs on him, when all that he had done had only made them angry, they sought to stone him. They sought to throw him over a hill. They wanted to put him to death. Jesus saw this. One day he said to his disciples who were showing him the temple, you see these things? Not one stone shall be left standing upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus had sat on a hillside. Now, I don't know if it's true, but I was told I was sitting in the very spot where Jesus sat. He looked down across the Kedron. He saw the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And there, the focal point that captivated one's attention, gleaming in the light of the eastern sun, shining like it was on fire, the gold reflecting the glory of the sun, was of this most magnificent temple. And the disciples were proud of it. Jesus sat there, and in a soliloquy greater than Hamlet's, he cried out, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens, but you wouldn't let me. Now your house. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. Earlier he said, this is my church. Now he says, it's your house. No longer mine. You wouldn't obey me, not mine. You didn't love me, not mine. You wouldn't receive the truth, you're no longer my church. Your house is left unto you desolate. Then he said to those disciples, not one stone shall be left standing upon another. Well now wait a minute Lord, you mean to tell me you are unchurched? Or oh, he said to his disciples, listen Peter, thou art Peter, Petros. But upon this rock, Petra, I, maybe it's important to say this here. You who listen to people say that Jesus built his church on Peter. I feel sorry for him if he did that. <laughs> the word Peter comes from the Greek word Petros, masculine singular. Thou art Petros, Greek. But upon this Petra, what's the difference? Petros means a rolling stone or a pebble. But upon this Petra, Petra means a solid rock of immense proportion. Well, what in the world was that solid rock? Peter had just said to him in Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this unto you, but my Father revealed it unto you. Reveal what? That I am the Son of the living God. You are a pebble, but on this rock, your confession, on this rock that I am the Son of God, upon the rock, Christ Jesus, I build my church. Now he's got another pronoun going. That was my church. But they rebelled against the truth. Now it's their church. But I got me a church. I'm going to build mine on the solid rock. I'm going to be the chief cornerstone. I'm going to be the foundation. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. And everybody who believes in me and falls in love with me will keep my commandments. They will be my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And when Jesus got ready to die, he took them to his church. It didn't have a piano. It didn't have an organ. It didn't have a wonderful choir. When they got up there, it was just a room. The upper room. They didn't have any stained glass. They didn't have any soft cushions. But let me tell you what they did have. It came to them on the day of Pentecost. Like cloven tons of fire. They didn't have all the accoutrements and the riches of many of the churches and synagogues round about, but they had the Holy Ghost. Would somebody say amen out there? And they had the truth. I'm telling you from my heart, I 
I'd rather worship God in truth under a tree than to worship in error in a gorgeous cathedral. I'd rather be where Jesus is. Amen. And he is always where the truth is. Amen. And so on the day of Pentecost, Jesus had already changed churches. The disciples had already changed churches. And when Peter started to preach and the Holy Ghost fell on that crowd, 3,000 people. Now the reason they were there was to worship at Jerusalem. That's why they came. But when they heard the gospel on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 of them said, y'all go on over there. We're going to stay over here. We're going to join these people. Now they don't have a building like y'all got. And they don't have all these other beautiful things. But they got the truth. Did not our hearts burn within us? They got the truth. And 3,000 changed churches. And yet we married the buildings. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many they be which go in there. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life. And few there be that fight. Brothers and sisters. I don't care how precious it is. If it's going to keep you out of the kingdom of God, cut it off. I don't care how much you depend on it. If it's going to stop you from serving the Lord, cut it off. If it's as close to you as your right eye, pluck it out. Cut it off. Get rid of it. There is nothing. I said nothing more important than coming to Jesus now than serving Jesus now than walking with Jesus now and I guarantee you you won't starve to death I guarantee you that you never had it so good I guarantee you that his way is the way of happiness and peace I guarantee you that his way offers hope eternal and it takes courage to obey God when Jesus was here he didn't want to die on the cross when Jesus was here and they brought out that whip and they started flailing his back and the rawhide leather tore his skin and the bits of bone that were attached to the ends of those thongs, buried themselves in his hide. And when they snatched it back, it ripped him open. His back was like a raw steak. He didn't enjoy that. Don't you think for a moment it didn't hurt? And after they had done their best and covered him with blood and sweat and spit, they dropped a 350 pound hardwood cross on his shoulders and they made him carry it but with all the bleeding and having not eaten he weakened and fell more than once he tried to do it for us he weakened and fell and finally they forced Simon to carry the cross he dropped it on the top of dead man's hill and they grabbed him and they slammed him down roughly. And they stretched out his arms and they put their knees on him. And they brought the Roman nails and the Roman hammer. And they set that thing in the palm of his hand. And they brought the hammer down. And if you close your eyes and imagine you can hear the hammer ringing. They were nailing the Son of God to a pinion. Jesus didn't enjoy that. But he hanged in there you and for me what are you willing to do for him they stretched him up in the air they dropped that cross into a hole prepared for it with a sickening thud ripping open those wounds the nails had made he groaned in his agony but opened not his mouth he took it he took it how much do you care about him he took all of that while he's hanging there they are wagging their heads and hurling their maledictions and insults. And he looks down in the crowd and sees his mother fainting 
fainting beneath the cross. And he called John. He couldn't even come down to lift his mother up. He said, John, behold my mother. Take care of my mother, John. Woman, behold thy son. And he stayed up there. They told him to come down. If you were Christ, come down and save yourself. He could have come down, but he couldn't come down and save us. So it was more important to save us than to save himself. And then as the smell of blood filled the air, gnats and flies gathered in his wounds. And he couldn't even drive them away. His hands were fastened. And the buzzards began to circle overhead. They smelled death coming. And they were used to visiting crosses and plucking out the succulent eyeballs and eating the flesh even before the malefactor died. Jesus was there, dying like a common thief, dying the death of the wretched, dying the way you and I should have died. But he hung in there. He hung in there until finally his heart ruptured in his chest. He screamed in his passion. One doctor writing about it said, the ordinary reflex is to grab your heart, but he couldn't. His hands were fastened. So he screamed in his passion and dropped his head in the hollow of his shoulder and he died. And they buried him in a barred tomb. He hung in there. How much do you love him? I want you to bow your heads right now. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath morning. We thank you for gathering with us today. We thank you, Lord, that we could be somewhere else. But we are here to worship the Lord in a spirit of truth and holiness. We beg you, Lord, to bless us to decide for Jesus now. Bless everybody in this auditorium. Speak to your people through the Holy Spirit. Help them to know that excuses will not be heard in the day of judgment. Help them to decide for heaven, to decide for Jesus, to decide for eternal life, and to decide today. Lord, I beg it, and I know good and well that they're going to need help with these decisions. I know good and well, Lord, that they're going to have to have the Holy Spirit to help them to overcome everything and to stand firm till Jesus comes. I pray for the Spirit to come upon your people right now. I pray that the angels of God will guard them and encourage them. I pray that thou, O oh Lord, will fill them and make them your children today. And may we leave this place understanding that we belong to Jesus. And as I have said night after night, there is someone who cares that things stand in his place. There is someone who cares. He pleads with a tear-stained face. There is someone who cares, and he'll help you run this race. Well, that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace as you decide to follow only Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.